Greetings from the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park. The National Park Service is comprised of 419 sites, each one telling their unique part of the American story. Here, we tell the story of America's greatest gift to the world, jazz. At New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park, it is our mission to enhance the understanding and appreciation of jazz music. We accomplish this through workshops, educational programs, and of course, musical performances. Find out more about us on our Facebook page or at our website at www.nps.gov backslash jazz. For the visually challenged, we would like to describe what the video will look like. Fred Caston will be conducting the interview from a desk with an overhead microphone. The person being interviewed will be responding to Fred's questions via their own home setup utilizing their own in-home tools. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy Talking Jazz with Fred Caston. Greetings from the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park. The National Park Service is comprised of 419 sites, each one telling their unique part of the American story. Here, we tell the story of America's greatest gift to the world, jazz. At New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park, it is our mission to enhance the understanding and appreciation of jazz music. We accomplish this through workshops, educational programs, and of course, musical performances. Find out more about us on our Facebook page or at our website at www.nps.gov backslash jazz. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Talking Jazz with Fred Kasten. Let's, let's go all the way back to uh, the, the beginning. Uh, where'd you grow up? Um, well, I, I was born in New England. Um, I was born in Lowell, Mass. Lived in New Hampshire for a short amount of time. And my parents moved to Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston. Mm -hmm. And um, then by the time I went to college, by the time I was 17, 18, I, I left New England. Um, went to school in the SUNY system. In, uh, in Potsdam, New York, and then uh, after that, North Carolina, and was never back in the North since. Well, I mean, I've been to visit, but you know, never lived there again. <laughs> Have you given up the cold weather uh, for the better? You think? <laughs> uh, it's it's just the culture. Um, I always the, the music and the, well, it's the musical culture. The musical culture in the South just far surpasses um, what's going on up north. Yeah. Uh, well, what, was music something that entered your life early? Did you get interested in it pretty pretty quick as a little kid? Right. Yeah. yeah. When I was, um, so there was always um, good music being played in my house, whether it was my dad playing, you know, Stravinsky or Oscar Peterson or, or Miles or, or Kenny Kirkland. And you know, I remember being in the back of my dad's truck at like five years old and six years old and, and, and um, you know, banging on the, on the trim of the, of the car while he's listening, he's got Kenny Kirkland and Bramford and, you know, Bramford and Kenny Kirkland and Winton on with he was playing at the time. And then my mom had Sinatra, you know, a lot of like, uh, um, uh, Frank Sinatra, sometimes Nina Simone, you know, there was a lot of good music being played in the house. Um, she played a lot of Motown, uh, Michael Jackson. And so being around that stuff just kind of set me up to start playing in early age. So when I was six, um, my dad signed me up for piano lessons, both my parents did, and um, they had no idea whether I'd like it or not. And quite frankly, I don't even remember if I liked it. <laughs> um, and I started studying classical, but I was so enamored by jazz that they could hardly get me to practice the stuff that I was given. This was your, your, your love of jazz just from hearing the music in the, in the house mostly at that point? Yeah, yeah, and then my grandfather played too. Not semi-professionally you know i think he he was in I don't know, finance or something but he also had a band uh you know since um since world war ii he had a his own group he was a jazz musician a piano player so in fact i ended up inheriting his piano when he passed so i still still have that so you know my uncle played drums my my grandmother would sing and um you know and and 
everyone wasn't necessarily professional about it. Just at some points in their life, they were, but mm -hmm. when, I was when, really the first to be a professional. Uh, uh, at family get-togethers, was music a part of the no. festivities? Well, it depends. If at my grandfather and my and my my grandparents' house, my on my dad's side, yeah. My grandparents uh -huh. and my mom's side weren't uh, weren't musical. It was uh -huh. all on my dad's side, and um, yeah, I remember going down to see them. They lived in South Carolina, and um, you know, there would always be my grandfather would always be at the piano, and sometimes I had other friends that my grandfather played with that would come and sit in and, and uh, you know, family gatherings. And it was, it, yeah, there was always music. So, that, was there already a piano in your house before you began lessons, or did that come with the right? Uh, yeah, there was. I, I don't remember what kind it was, it was made by Boston or something, but anyways, yeah, there was a piano there, and um, um. Yeah, and it was one of my grandparents every time I went right. there. Did you, know. you, were you the kind of kid who would mess around with it a little bit to try to pick out two I, or anything? I did. Well, once I, I, I don't remember prior to starting lessons. Because again, I was like six or seven, and right. so that was 30 years ago. But um, once I started taking lessons, I remember sitting at the piano and trying to figure out more stuff from what I want. I remember, I remember the day I discovered how to play a triad. And I remember going to my dad so excited and saying, look what, what happens when you play these three notes together. <laughs> yeah. I remember that. Yes. Discovering stuff on my own. And then, you know. Uh -huh. And so the other thing too, I remember it was also, it was my, my grandfather was always, I, you never see the stuff on TV anymore. My grandfather always found these, these, these shows. He'd find like, live recordings of of uh oh man i don't know like um any, anyone that's still alive you'd find live recordings of bill evans you'd find live recordings of 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 um you know winton and and uh, herbie and he put these stuff on these things on vhs and he mail them to my dad huh. and so we you know we'd watch some of the stuff at the house too and right. that really got me into seeing like the live videos of it right so, well, as, so as you're studying the uh, classical repertoire, typical piano student repertoire, uh, were you then trying to apply some of the fluency you were developing to this music you were a little more interested in? Um, it was the other way around, and it drove my teacher crazy. <laughs> I, you know, I'd be I'd be playing WC or, or you know, um, whatever she had me working on at the time, Tchaikovsky, and and, and I'd be you know improvising while playing these pieces uh, put my you know it's just, it's, I, th I think uh she did her best <laughs> to, to try to keep me on track but uh, I, I was so enamored by jazz that you know and i'm sure naturally i i, I incorporated what i was learning in classical in terms of the technical proficiency uh, right but yeah so you, you were just uh they it was she didn't wrap your knuckles or anything, but uh, you you went out there anyway. <laughs> you couldn't help yourself, right? Yeah, and I, yeah, yeah. I did, and eventually, I ended up. I, I did start taking jazz lessons, but I, that wasn't until I was like twelve or so. Was that so, with uh, Charlie? Right. Yeah, Charlie Benakis. So that my dad put me on a. He was. Um, a lot of people know who Charlie is in the, in the jazz community because he was a well-known teacher, taught out of uh, New England Conservatory, worked with Jerry Bugante, worked with a lot of people up in that area. And he had a three-year waiting list back then to study with him. So my dad preemptively put me on the list at like nine years old and completely forgot about it. And at 12, we get a call. Yep, I got a, I got a position open <laughs> yes. I got a, I got a, or a slot open. I mean, uh -huh. And uh, yeah, he did mail correspondence with students well, well before the internet and email, at least before it was you know, right. in general public. Uh, he did uh, uh, snail mail correspondence with people all around the world. He had students in, in Asia that he would mail correspond with. They would send an uh, 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 audio tape back to him on what their, you know, their lesson, and he would write everything out, mail it back. I mean, he was just like... He had so many students, and he had he had he had really found a way to, uh, you know, I'm 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 often against against quantifying jazz and, and making it into something that you can teach and a product that you can put into schools, but because a lot of times it's not done right. But he really had a way of doing it right. Yeah, you know, he knew how to quantify his stuff in, in in such a way that didn't um, 
that didn't make the music so pre-prescribed wow. for the student. That didn't teach you how to just play licks, you know. So he was he was a real sought after teacher. And anyway, he said uh, twelve, and we got the call. And so I started studying with him then. How did you like that? Did uh, did you take to his ways of teaching right away? Well, the, the timing was it was not great in terms of my age. You know, this is adolescence. I'm about to be a teenager, and I just, you know, looking back, I wish I had taken it more seriously. Um, I was probably driving my dad crazy with it because you know the lessons were cheap, of course, and they're only a half hour lesson. He's giving you all this material, and I was enamored by it, but I just didn't have the focus at that time right, right. to sit down and do diligence to you know to the, the material that was. He was giving me take the fullest advantage of right, of, right. Of it. I, def I definitely did appreciate it, and I, I, I loved it, and I, you know, and it, it had a big part in making me who I am. Yeah. You know, well, today. I know one one of one of his uh, mantras is uh, play in every key. What's that, Charlie? Uh, Charlie's. Yeah, I mean, make sure you know every scale, every key. Uh, it has uh, lessons on all the modes and uh, he try does. all kind of interesting. Uh, he uh, had some crazy more breaking down music. He did, yeah, he did. One of his more interesting, well, here's so many interesting things, but one thing he did that, I mean, this is like, this was Charlie to, to a T. I remember he uh, was trying to teach me to read in different clefs, in different, in different keys. So he would take the music and he would, so that way I couldn't use my ear uh, or, or to relatively figure out something to forget. And he turned the page upside down and had me sight read it. You know, uh, like, yeah, it's yeah, really, really smart uh, way to do it, too. I mean, yeah, you know. no, you can't. I mean, you have to be, uh, a, you know, savant to be able to cheat on that <laughs> of a very unusual uh, variety. Of a very unusual character, right? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> right. Well, uh, so you're getting instruction from one of the one of the real great piano uh, teachers, uh, just music teachers in in available to anyone at, at that time. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, whether or not you took fullest advantage of it, you absorbed a hell of a lot. Oh yeah. 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 Actually my, my dad, my dad just retired a couple of weeks ago. And so, you know, he, he started getting back into practice and piano again. So oh, well, let me send you some of Charlie's notes. So I dug up the notes I had from 25 years ago and sent them to him. And it was, you know, it was amazing to look at all the, just the amount of knowledge that he had in the, the way that he had, the, the, the method he had to of, of dispelling this information to students was just was incredible. So. He was also a pretty good player, right? I, I never heard him, but. Uh, yeah, and I didn't hear a lot of him. You know, I only heard he would just, he would demonstrate to me. Yeah. But, you know, I've searched recordings and stuff, and I'm sure there's some he's on that I, maybe if I dug a little deeper, but it's hard to find information on him. Yeah. You know, part of it because he passed before, Pretty early, uh, yeah. Before YouTube and everything became so prevalent. Right. Yeah. Well, um, by the time, let's say you're uh, now that you're getting uh, you're getting these lessons with Charlie, um, were you looking around or seeing other kids your age who are interested in the same thing or anybody you could play with or try to play? Oh yeah, well that was with? nice. I, you know, I always had a weird rapport with musicians until I got older. Um, there, there was something about musicians particularly in in uh in the north where it was like there how do i explain this there was just this this nerd mentality about it where it just you you know it was you couldn't play the music and 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 be like a down-to-earth person it was the, 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 hum, the human element was was lost and, and and the people that were playing the music up there acted that same way you know it was like if you if you had any interest outside of music if you were interested in sports or something I was like man what kind of weird person are you why are you <laughs> playing this music uh, and so i always had i just i was never just such a one-track mind and i and i had such a hard time getting along with other musicians so it it, it was only sporadically that i would find people to play with right because you know you start to play with them, you realize this personality clash existed. You know, and that was actually one of the things. And I'm just segue too much, but that it kind of attracted me to the South. There was something about when I moved down south, there was a different attitude mm -hmm. towards the music and, and an acceptance of yeah, you can you can have other interests, you can be 
into this and to that, but you can still be a jazz musician. Right. You know? Yeah. And, yeah. You got to have a life in order to have something to uh, interpret on the bandstand. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, well, um, back, back, uh, back there, um, uh, in uh, in earlier days, before you headed south, um, you went north <laughs> to uh, yeah. to college, all the way up in Potsdam. That's which probably a lot closer to Montreal than to New York City. It was, right? yeah. We went there. We went to Montreal a lot. Well, that pretty nice little jazz scene up up there in a big school at McGill. Right, McGee, a McGee, as they say in uh, Montreal. <laughs> yeah, we go, we went to there was there was uh, a lot of good guys at, at McGill. We played. I think we played at the festival there one time and stuff and. Uh, it was a scene, it definitely was. And uh, let's see, that was the uh, the Crane Crane School of Music at Crane School uh, of Music, Potsdam, yeah. SUNY Potsdam. Potsdam. We studied with uh, with uh, Brad Zvodzak. He's a really really talented trombone player and a good teacher. We had a good program up there. So it had a surprisingly uh, had a surprisingly strong program. Uh, I learned a lot up there. You know, the kids were we were all hungry. Everyone was transcribing, trying to push each other, and we, we had some real talent up there, actually. So, yeah. what, were you uh, into even before you got to, to college? Were you into composing or writing uh, writing things, Ryan? I know you, uh, you you got pretty deep into it in in your studies. Yeah, I mean, that's where I got my master's, and I, you know, I think I was more into it when I got to college than I was before college. Before. The truth. Truth is, I can't. Even, I can't remember that far back. Um, <laughs> the, the, my, what I remember most about playing and, and studying was playing along with records. That was sort of oh, the biggest right. thing when I was a kid. I don't think I spent so much time writing as I did transcribing. I was really interested in what other people were doing more than what I could do. You know, I, I, I wanted to, to learn how they did their thing, and I just. I, I think I always felt like I didn't. At that age, I didn't have anything worth writing or worth saying because I didn't know enough. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I've heard it many, many times uh, from a, a wide range of artists. I'm thinking of Dave Stryker particularly right now. I said the best way to learn jazz is to listen to it. It's true. This is the best way to learn a lot of things going on right now is just to listen. Yeah. Yeah. Open your yeah. ears. Uh, yeah. And, and as, as, Mo, as uh, Mo said, your mind is on vacation and your mouth is working overtime in some cases. Yeah. Uh, just, that that relates to to social situations too. A lot of listening. Yes. Uh, so, so you went you went straight through uh, that uh, undergraduate and got a, a degree there uh, at. Uh, at uh, well, it was it was yeah yeah. I actually went for physics. Is what I initially went for, and then I I got to uh, got to differential equations. And I said, yeah, this this ain't happening. And the whole time I was also studying jazz. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, I, I ended up leaving though with a degree in finance and jazz. Finance and jazz. So. What, what uh, was science or math, uh, physics, even long term interests of yours? Always been. My dad was an engineer and, and um, you know, I picked up a lot from him. Um, and it, it all, you know, all fields of science and, and it, so I guess I kind of inherited that interest. And um, yeah, I was always into different areas of science and, and, and you know, and math a bit too, so. Yeah, well, I, I hated those damn, uh, a train leaves New York City no, they were at 803. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, once you start getting, uh, putting integrals into them, then uh, it's, a different, yeah. it's a different game. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, well, it, 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 I always see, I, I, I always feel and see, uh, if I sit at the piano, a, a, a kind of connection between math and music, or a pretty profound one, really. Yeah. Yeah, I always, that, you know, it's interesting to say that I always struggled with that. I, I, I as a teacher, a lot of the times, uh, well, not a lot of times, but there, there's instances where I've, I've, had, I've had to teach students who were, you know, adults that were engineers, or computer programmers, something in the sciences and math and the fields of science and math. And, and so they, they had this connection to jazz. And, I, and, and I've heard so many students say the same thing. Oh, I can see how this relates to math and science. But it always drove me crazy because they would play that way, too. 
So, you know, I feel like I've spent half my life as an educator trying to teach people to, to make a disconnect between the two, you know, because yeah, yeah, you can, you can relate them, but the problem is it sounds like that. Right. So, uh, you know, and, and, the, and the train A and train B leaving the station, uh, when you when you put in the music, it's just as boring. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. Right. It's it's uh, there's it loses all the humanity or the soul. It seems to drain right, right. out of it if you get too much. Me- get that mechanical in in the way you proceed, which right. is probably what you felt as much as anything when you came south. Is there's nothing. I mean, it is a soul drenched and story drenched part of our nation, you know, part of the world. And both right. of those things, I think, go together in, in making great music. So yeah, it's the elements story. I was missing. Yeah. Well, so you went to um, a, a historically black uh, college. Right. HBCU. Uh, yeah. And, uh, how, and what, how did that get on your radar? Uh, well, uh, Central, I... Uh, Central, North Carolina Central. Yep, NCCU. I mean, that school was... If anyone out there is looking to study jazz, I'll tell you, this place to go. So um, I, I, I moved down south and, um, uh, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was starting a gig. I had a regular day job and um, I was trying to get more and more in the scene. I was like, man, why don't I, why don't I just go to grad school? The, the timing was right. Um, I was in a situation with, where it would have worked um, financially. I, I could have probably pulled it off. So I looked at, uh, at one school and, um, it was okay. Uh, nothing really stood out about it. And then, um, it was a vibraphone player, Steve, Steve Hobbs, who I started working with. He was one of the first people to call me when I moved down there. Uh, and where uh, was this? Where'd you live? Moved to? In, in Raleigh. Okay. Uh, so I, I was, I played piano on a cruise ship for about like eight months right out of college. Uh-huh. And I was on a cruise ship I remember telling someone, yeah, I'm going to move to North Carolina. I was seeing a girl at the time who moved to North Carolina. It's always the way. Right? Yes, uh, it's an age-old story, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. The, uh, the, the guy on the cruise ship he was doing the gig with said, yeah, I'll put you in contact with someone. So he gave me the contacts in North Carolina. And one of these, these guys, this vibraphone player, Steve Bob, said, man, go check out uh, NCCU. Hmm. And um, I went to NCCU and... And I just the caliber of, of educators there, not to mention the fact that Brant Marcellus and Joey Calderazzo were teaching, yeah, which is, right. you know, yeah. in itself is killing. But just the, the educators had it were just, they, they were all there for the right reasons. They had such a passion and understanding for the music. And to, you know, and to be real about it, you're, you're studying it at the source of the music. It's black music. And, and you're studying it at a, at a black university, which is, right. I mean, that's that's a real good way to try to understand from you know from white culture how this music works. You know, it's it's at least one of the best ways you're gonna get to do it next to going to a black church. Right. Um, so uh, I, I was real impressed with the program, and I uh, studied there with uh, Dr. Ira Wiggins and, and Bramford and Joey and Nora Helm, Baron Thomas, a whole host of good teachers there, and did. Um, Comp, uh, my master's in composition and arranging. And I tell you, it was one of the best, but one of the hardest two years of my life. Uh-huh. It and was, uh, yeah. Right next door, uh, and it's right next door in Durham, right? The, uh, the campus. It's in Durham. Yeah, it's, it's right in the heart of Durham. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, that's, that's a, that the triangle there is, is quite an, it's a very interesting area. It's uh, not like the re- much of the rest of North Carolina outside of maybe Asheville. No, 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 no. And it's different from Asheville too. I mean, it's, and there's some similarities, I guess, if you look at you know, on the political spectrum, but no, it's, it is a very unique area because you have, you have Duke, you have NCCU, you have UNC Chapel Hill, um, you get NC State, that's kind of a different thing. You know, and, and all three of those schools have have, have uh, some pretty good music programs. So right, right, yeah. Uh, so, uh, what what convinced you uh, to to go into the composition end of it? There, what uh, had that been something on your mind for a bit? Um, I think I, you know, honestly, I just thought it was going to be more functional in in in, in working. Uh-huh. I wasn't worried about the performance side. I figured, man, any. any performance aspects I'm going to get on the bandstand. Right. But um, the arranging stuff was, was, I wasn't good at it. Um, 
I still struggle with it. Yeah. It's, it's something you're going to do every day. But anyways, I, I, I was struggling with it and I realized that uh, that was the time to get better. And if there was anything that was going to help me get a job in music, which we know is difficult, that would have, that would have uh, probably been my best bet. Mm -hmm. So, and it, it was, I, I was, uh, every day I was like, man, why did I do this? It was so difficult. <laughs> it was so worth it though. Uh -huh. So it, it, it was kind of like musical uh, compositional boot camp there. You know, once, once you got through it, you were in shape, but man, it was uh, a rough while you're getting there. <laughs> oh yeah. And you know, and the, the students that I was, my, my classmates in the, in the undergrad and grad program there were just like, they were so talented. I learned so much from the, the students there and there, some of their writing and arranging abilities were just like, man, how did I, what am I, I, I don't even belong here. You know, so there's some real talent there, and I learned a lot from my from my peers as well as the teachers. Were you? Uh, uh, was there much of a jazz scene, or were there places to play outside of the school? Yeah. So North Carolina, for for anyone out there listening, North Carolina has a scene for sure. North Car I mean, I'll put it with. Uh, there, there's not many places I've seen in the country outside of New Orleans, New York. There's, there's parts out in the West Coast. Durham is another is another major spot you know you get to figure you got you got some guys former basic big band members living there of course you got grant and joey you got kobe Watkins, a phenomenal drummer living there um you, you've got a lot of people with some serious credentials even outside of that every there's a bunch of horn players there that were prince's band uh i mean you you could dig deeper and you could find more right. you know more accolades to recognize but it, and there was the, the support in this in the in the community itself too was huge um ncc there was this interesting tie between nccu and the community the community valued what valued central's program and, and what they had to offer and and, and, it, and they worked together hmm. um, so there was and a big, big part of that was the educators at Central. That was what separated them from other, other schools is that the teachers there were constantly out in the community trying to set up sessions, trying to set up places to play. Um, took us on tour to play at the Detroit Jazz Festival. I mean, they really got the music into the community and got the students out to play. And then once we, were, once we graduated, we were finding gigs on our own, you know, and good paying gigs. I, I remember I paid my own bills by gigging there. Uh -huh. So, yeah. yeah. Pretty hip. There's few, few towns, in, there's few <laughs> cities on. and towns in, in, in uh, the U.S. <laughs> to pay your bills playing, you know, playing jazz. That'll accord you that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you, uh, you got that master's and then you uh, uh, went to work at uh, East Carolina directly? Right. I, I, yeah, I, that's so. I uh, got a call. Uh, but a week before graduating from ECU, and I said, uh, we know you're graduating next week. Do you want to teach? I didn't even apply for this job. <laughs> so, and then, you know, and they asked me to teach uh, courses. I was just like, man, that's way over my head. But I said, no, we, we have some faith in you. And so they threw me right into it, and I was there for five years. Yeah. How did, how did you like it? Was that uh, once again, so, uh, once you got your – kind of bearings uh something you enjoy it was all right i i had some i i had you know i i don't like to go down this road uh, on this stuff but when you learn the music right from the source and then well not to write from the source, but you know right from more from the source than, and and then you go to uh what's typically a to be real about it a whitewashed educational situation and, and you know what what the truth is, and then you see how it's being presented to students right. by other people. You end up in a situation where you know you you you, ha you kind of have to either bite your tongue or you accept that you're going to say something and, and put your job at risk. And so that was kind of the situation I was in. So there was some tension, always. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was it was it was a tough situation mm -hmm. for me. Were, well, were you uh, looking around for a, a better thing to place to land? Uh, how did you uh, make the decision to come down here? Uh, to North oh, to New Orleans? No, to New Orleans, yeah. Were, were you, had oh, okay. you well, been so to New Orleans? Was... Up to that point, had you even been to New Orleans? Uh, 
No. So what happened, there's a, there's a whole period between there. Um, my son and, and my son's mom and I, um, she was offered a job in the Netherlands. And so we moved to Amsterdam for uh, three years. I left ECU because I was having issues there anyways with what I mentioned earlier. Um, so we went to the Netherlands and uh, I toured, taught a little bit master's classes. And we stayed there for about two and a half, three years. We always knew it was temporary and um, we we're trying to find, you know, the, the way to get back was once there was a job offer here. Right. So she got a job offer um, with Entergy and then uh, she said, well, would New Orleans work? It'll get us back to the U.S. I think Will so. it? <laughs> you know, and, and actually, I hadn't been here, but I, I, I knew a lot of people from here. Um, you know, I knew, I knew Adonis Rose, you know, pretty well. We've been working together with the bass player in North Carolina for a few years up to that point. And um, I also knew a lot of people from the Nojo because when I moved to the Netherlands, they needed a, a DD in the Nojo, DD Bridge uh -huh. They needed a, a, a sub to fill in. So Adonis called me. So flew me over to Italy. It was cheap. You know, the tickets are a couple hundred euros when you fly in the EU. Uh, so I did the gig and then I met, you know, everyone in the Nojo. And so when I came down here, I knew, you know, that's an extra 18 people, you know. Right. So it, it, that really you know, set me up. And, and Adonis, too, you know, I got to give credit to him credits too he he really helped me when i came to the new orleans and put me in the right places and introduced me to the people i needed to know and then i knew delphio because of brantford because i've been working with brantford back home um you know we did a couple i, I was fortunate to do a few gigs with them and so I, I he's always been a good friend and mentor and so i talked to him and I said, what should i do when i go to new orleans I said, talk to delphio go talk to my dad so he put in a good word for me with delphio and uh you know. Yeah, I, I, I can just imagine uh, how you, good you felt when your wife said, would New Orleans work? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that was... That was That's like, uh, yeah, well, maybe, okay, I'll, twist my arm. I'll get by. Yeah, somehow. <laughs> I'll, get, I'll make it happen. Yeah. 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 So you guys, um, was directly from Amsterdam? Uh, directly from Amsterdam, right? We actually moved here on my birthday. No so it was, uh, wow. this was yeah. fitting. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the pr two pretty good cities, man, to uh, have called right. home for a while. Uh, What's that? I see uh, uh, two beautiful cities to get to call home for a while. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when, when, when did you hit, uh, when did you land in New Orleans, Ryan? Um, what are we in, 2020, 2017, 2018, 2017? Yeah, 2017. Um, the tail end of it. So, yeah. and that you know, that was after being in, in Holland for a few years, so it was yeah. such a departure from uh, from the music scene that I had become used to. Right. Well, um, well, you, you uh, talked about a few people that you that you knew, uh, a little more than a few, because you had met quite a that uh, big band. But who, who did you get to start working with? Um, was it with Delphio or or? Yeah, Delphio? yeah. I, mean, I think I I, um, I showed up on the bandstand setting with Delphio. Um, like the the first in January, I moved here in December, and, and that first first uh, month, I went down and sat in, and you know, went through the whole hazing process that <laughs> you know, was on right. for quite a while. Right. And um, and Adonis started a group, Nojo Seven, just got an offshoot of the full Nojo. Oh. Um, and we did. I my first gig down here was New Year's Eve, and um. We did with the Nojo Seven, so and then that that continued for a long time, and then from there I just started meeting people and getting into the scene. And, mm -hmm. But that was really the, the springboard for me was was Nojo. Yeah, well, uh, and I, I think the first place I I saw you was I, I can't remember with whom now, but uh, was at Snug Harbor. Probably with Delph because that was the, those are the first gigs I was doing. Yeah. It was, you know, it was very impressive, man. I really said, hey, this guy, uh, I'm not sure where he's from, but he sounds good. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, and it, that, and that, uh, that was proven to be the case as I got more and more of an opportunity to hear. Uh, well, um, 
How did you, how did all this uh, sit with you after? Uh, did it start to feel like home pretty quick? Well, yeah, you know, it's it's changed my a lot has changed since living here, um, personally and musically. And, and musically, man, it's just I thought I'd done all the the I thought I'd learned what I needed to learn in North Carolina, and I, I did. I learned a lot, but there's a whole other thing here that musicians have that musicians don't have anywhere outside i mean like you listen to this to sounds like ellis lucian barbara and uh you know these guys just have this this it's just melodic and, and, and personal sound mm-hmm. and, and man and there's there's a thing in new orleans that no one else has which is it's not a contest when you play it's there's this laid back um uh, how to put it it's uh playing in this comfort zone you know we play comfortably can't play 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 melodically play stuff that it's you know it's, it's not out here it's not a contest it's a conversation you know, it's, yeah it's a right it's a conversation and it's and you don't find it anywhere else and that was something that's really missing that was really missing in my playing and i, and I picked it up here you know you like you listen to ellis and he's got what he plays makes so much sense or what he played, you know, it made so much sense. And, and like you listen to horn players, you go down to Prez Hall, this, the this stuff that comes out of their, their horns, it's, there's nothing overly technical about it. If it doesn't make musical sense, they don't play it. Right. There's no need to. And there's so many jazz musicians today that it's like, you know, what, what's the next big thing I can be? What's the next new thing in jazz I can do? And like, you know, most of it's been done. And so you just hear people that are, are, are playing stuff that's so overly complicated and no one can relate to. But down here, that that isn't the case. And part of it is because we, we still live off the music down here. And so we have to play in a way that people can relate to. Right. Right. You know, now I'm not saying that's necessarily why we do, but it is, you know. Well, uh, and to, as well, uh, Ryan, here, uh, art generally, music in particular, is a part of life. It's not a, a separate entity that stands out right. in daily life. You know, it, it is imbued in our very walking down the street. Right. You know. Right. And, and, you, and you hear that. Yeah. You know. It's, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're run, running to, towards the end here, but I did want to okay. check, get a little bit more uh, from you about just talking about how you uh, got with uh, Surreal and uh, the work you two guys are doing now. Oh yeah. Oh, so it's actually kind of an interesting story. So I was, um, there's a, there's a great local singer. Well, she's, well she's, from, she's moved here, but there's a great singer in the area, uh, Gabby Gavasta. She had a session with this place called the Starlight. It was all pre pandemic. And, um, we played it every Sunday and, you know, a lot of musicians just show up and hang for the session and play. And Cyril was one of them. And this was what, a year and a half ago now. And I always had, uh, you know, the immature aspect of me, I always had this thing against singers because I was always put in situations where they want to play the same tune. They don't know what key it's in. They can't sing in that key to, anyway, so it was irrelevant. <laughs> you know, they can't count the tune off. Every, it's like, there was, there's always this is pervasive issues that existed. And so I wasn't used to playing with singers that could sing, uh, that really were good. Um, and of course, Gabby and Cyril, uh, both can sing and and I'm, I remember Cyril getting up I had no idea who she was everyone in the in the audience like oh man Cyril a man and I didn't know unfortunately so she gets up and sings and she explains that I had kind of a chip on my shoulder you know it's like oh great here comes another singer and uh, so after she was done she went up to her friend who was a really great guitar player and I was like man I don't like that guy uh, and the guitar player said, well, he can really play, so why don't you give him another chance? All right, fine. So she called me for a gig. <laughs> and that was the rest of history. 